Well, hello, everyone. I'm James Dobson, and you're listening to Family Talk, a listener-supported ministry. In fact, thank you so much for being part of that support for James Dobson Family Institute. Welcome, everyone, to Family Talk, a radio production of the James Dobson Family Institute. I'm Roger Marsh, and I'm so grateful you've joined us today. Those who have listened to us for many years know that we are strongly devoted to the family. But with our many interviews dedicated to parenting and marriage, those who are single may feel left out. If you are an unmarried adult, we want you to know that you are important to our ministry. The conversation you're about to hear in just a moment deals with the many frustrations and issues that single people face. Joining Dr. Dobson on this classic interview were his close colleagues, Dr. Henry Cloud and Dr. John Townsend. Their discussion focused on the mentality of single men and women and how they can prepare for a relationship. Here now is Dr. Dobson to further introduce today's guests and topic on this edition of Family Talk. We're going to talk about single adults today. We're addressing this subject to those who were never married. And uh, there are some different needs there than just those who are uh, perhaps divorced and raising children or single for other reasons, maybe widowhood or what have you. But the uh, number of single listeners in our audience is very large and it's growing, uh, judging from the amount of mail that we receive. And uh, these individuals care passionately about family matters. They want to know how they can meet the right person, how they can make uh, good decisions about relationships, uh, how to get out from under loneliness in some cases. Not everybody feels that way, but many do. And here to help us tackle these questions today are Dr. John Townsend and Dr. Henry Cloud. Uh, Over the years, these gentlemen have become specialists in the area of counseling for single adults, uh, lecturing for Campus Crusade, uh, church groups, uh, as well as maintaining busy private practices. Uh, Both gentlemen, both Henry and John, were awarded doctorates in clinical psychology from Biola University in La Mirada, California. If you detect a slight southern accent in our guests, you're not imagining things. Uh, John hails from Wilson, North Carolina, and Henry from Vicksburg, Mississippi. Gentlemen, welcome. Pleasure to be here. We have no more time for the broadcast. It's been good to have (laughs) have you with us. Uh, I depicted uh, the never married individual as one who often deals with uh, self searching kind of a discontent with life. Is that accurate or is that um, a caricature? Uh, What has been your experience? What we have found is that if if you look at a a demographic survey uh, of singles, you'll find them pretty high-functioning people who have uh, begun careers, are actively searching for that that other person, or are, are trying to relate to some kind of a group. But in a large majority, uh, there is some sort of a discomfort level about the state of singleness. Now, um, those who have been single for a while who uh, didn't ever see it as a deficit come out kind of happy about it. But we, we see more and more people who are, are looking at singleness as something that they shouldn't be and uh, are, are reaching some kind of vague discomforts about it. We try to design every broadcast with somebody in mind. Uh, In other words, uh, each one is different, and we aim it at an individual. Don't always hit that target, and sometimes it may be useful for those that we're not aiming at. But let me read for you who the intended audience for today is. It is a person. It is an individual. Uh, Perhaps uh, 27 to 35 years of age, never married, um, a listener who feels perhaps the same way they did on on the playground in elementary school, uh, where teams uh, were being chosen for kickball or for baseball or what have you, and one by one their friends were chosen or picked, and yet they remain in the middle of the field and haven't been selected yet. Uh, they wonder, uh, is something wrong with me? Why haven't I been picked? Why haven't I been selected? Am I capable of playing the game? Or Mm -hmm. in this case, uh, dealing with relationships, am I capable of loving and being loved? Mm -hmm. Uh, How common is the emotional characteristic that I just described? All too common. You have just described someone that no one may on the outside know feels like that. 
And yet, when you ask them if they're single by choice or by default, in their heart of hearts, when alone at night or when they're being very honest, uh, they're going to say a lot of times, it was by default. It wasn't my choice. And they're going to come out with a lot of real, wh- what you might call, um, victimized feelings about it, that someone somewhere in the plan has, has not measured up to, or not let them measure up for them. Henry, I, b- I believe you guys uh, did a radio program for a while, uh, four hours on Saturday just for such individuals, just for singles. What did you hear hour after hour? Well, it's interesting. You know, people bring up certain issues and they talk about struggles with sexuality or intimacy or relationships or career. And you hear these these single topics. But what we found was that those are all symptoms. When, When people struggle in those issues of singlehood, generally speaking, what they're struggling in is some sort of developmental process that was not completed in their family of origin. And they're, they're sort of stuck in some ways. I, when you were talking about the kid on the playground, for example, and the single wonders, is something wrong with me? Well, a lot of times, yes, in that there is something that's, that's not completed from developmental stages, and that has prevented them from a lot of times uh, moving on in Such as what? Give me an example. Well, What's a developmental stage that didn't get consummated? Uh, for example, a lot of people, because of coming from broken homes or homes where there were problems, do not learn how to emotionally attach to other people. That is a big one, and a lot of the cries of aloneness and desperation come from people who really have not been in settings where they learned to attach emotionally. They learned to bond. They um, didn't learn to, to invest themselves emotionally, and as a result, they've had to sort of stay distant. Low self-esteem play a big role in that inability to bond? Absolutely. Times. Yeah. Absolutely. Because there is a fear of some level that if... I were to be really known by you, you would turn and walk yeah. away from me. And they'll experience this thousands of times in real life as well as just in their imaginations. When, when we talk about the problem of emotional isolation, it's not a problem of being alone. It's a problem of oftentimes being alone in the midst of a lot of other people. And people just can't emotionally attach, and they feel very isolated in large Sunday school groups a lot of times. Uh, let's talk about the Sunday school because... Uh, uh, typically, uh, single adults are isolated in uh, isolated. There's that word again. They're they're segregated in classes just for those who are single adults. Do you all think that's a mistake? Had you rather see them integrated throughout the church, or had you rather see social groups uh, uh, or uh, clusters, if you will, of those who are in that particular status of life? I'd rather see them integrated. John? Well, I think there's a place for the other because they are looking for a place to meet other people. But I think the problem comes when you've got people who can't bond with people who can't bond, you end up with a lot of lonely people and you just square the number. And so if, if there was some kind of a way that the family, the nuclear families in that body can reach out as well as the people mm-hmm. having a place for themselves to go, you've got the best of both worlds. All right, now we're getting you know, to a real key. <clears throat> we, we see a lot of single people who are stuck in some developmental passage. And the the church very oftentimes is the healing agent some some family within the church will sort of take them in not as an incompetent who can't earn a living or can't fix their own meals or something like that but but somewhere where for instance if they've never had anyone nurture them if they've never had somewhere where they can be accepted and reveal themselves and and cry when so- something goes wrong or whatever they learn those skills they learn to receive love when they've never had there it. is and a so, longing to be around children that's to right. be around uh, people who are married. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of my graduate training involved as a single person going through a program where everybody else was married, and so some people in the church did that for me and would just make sure, because I didn't know how to ask for things from, from, from families, and that's the thing about singles. They don't know how to ask a lot of times. John, how old were you before you got married? Uh, I was 36. Would you have resented uh, the assumption we almost made a minute ago that everybody who's not married by 35 years of age uh, has an inability to bond. Um, if I was had been 30 years old, I would have resented it. At 35 or 6, I would have understood it a lot better because I think a lot of it for me was bonding to work because bonding to someone else in a very intimate way was still, I think, at a very honest level, a frightening thing for me. 
and that sort of commitment. How, put that fear into words on behalf of those who may be experiencing it. Well, if you happen to have an avocation or a passion, let's say, a ministry or a schooling or a career or a hobby, uh, that's a lot easier to connect with than another person who might look at you and say, you know, um, what I see isn't really uh, what I want. And you don't suffer as much rejection from those sort of things. How about boundary needs? You've talked about that as oh, well. Oh, gosh. You yeah. know, it's interesting. Today, adolescence lasts until, you know, because of the needs for higher education and career moves. It, it goes into 25, 30, 50 years old sometimes. Yeah, it really does. It's and a lot of pe- people have not finished that sort of in-between period, especially if they're single. And the... The leaving has not been completed, so the cleaving can take place. As a result, they don't have a good sense of limits in their lives. They can't set limits on abusive relationships. They, they can't say no to people hurting them, for example. And they, they need to learn how to set limits and boundaries and grow up. What does that have to do with still being an adolescent? You mean that they allowed their parents to... They relate to them that way, and therefore they allow other people. They never really separated from their parents. And I think the complaint of all the passive men in the church, for example, are a lot of men who have not separated from their parent figures. They're, they're still yes men. They're not aggressive. They don't have opinions of their own. They're, they're a lot of people pleasers. And so the women gripe about these non-aggressive Christian men who, who are all nice guys, and then in the world they're attracted to the aggressive achievers. We believe that for someone to be, I guess, grown up in the image of God, that there's a thinking that they've got to go through. There's a uh, a period, like when Jesus said, don't call anybody on earth your father. He, he knew that sooner or later you're going to have to sit down and say, do I agree with the values of my parents? You know, What do I believe that, that I have thought through that maybe they haven't thought through in a different way? And there are people who have never questioned those things, what they think biblically, what they think uh, relationally, culturally, what they think about the family. And what happens is as they're fused to their family, no one can ever match up to what their family had in this ideal sense. Now, where boundaries come in is when they can finally say, I still love my family of origin, but I differ with them in some ways, and I can make distinctions between myself and you know, um, the good old days, which mm. a lot of times weren't the good old days, then I am free to find someone else that's not perfect either. Uh, gentlemen, it's been my observation that men and women, as two classifications, uh, who are single come at their singleness from a different direction. They're not thinking and feeling the same things. See if you agree. Uh, Women, quote, are ready to settle down and are frustrated by the lack of seriousness in men. They perceive men as passive and detached, in love with their work, as you said, John, and afraid of commitment. Also, the non-Christian men they meet at work seem to be much more aggressive than the men that they meet at church. Men, on the other hand, perceive women as too hungry for commitment and communication. They feel that women are making too many demands on them and are giving mixed signals to saying yes and acting no. As a result, men begin to withdraw. Elaborate on that. Do you agree with it? I think there's a lot of truth in there. I think that when you look at, for example, the bonding needs of a woman, okay, she grew up, and her first bond was with mother. And to, to grow up and become an adult, to get married is to establish a very, very adult bond for her. To have uh, friends and be close to other women is a regressive move for her. And so a lot of times a woman can gladly look for security in the bonding of another relationship, a man. For a man, however, there are aggressive things that that seem to be more adult sorts of things, and oftentimes he's moving in that direction. So you get a a squabble over this commitment phobia, which is actually a squabble over developmental issues a lot of times. Uh, You agree, John? Let me give an example, Dr. Dobson, to kind of to bring it into perspective. A lot of men have come from families where being aggressive was not a good thing, um, where they had to be nice for their family's sake. They couldn't be, they couldn't have conflict, they couldn't disagree, and so they learned to kind of stay in the shadows in order to stay out of trouble. While a lot of women have been given a lot of good training in being aggressive, 
in being able to, to say what they need and to say to someone, I want to be with you, I want to spend time with you, I need you. These words can come easier to their lips. And so what happens is you get this constant frustration with this woman who wants what God built into her, the sense of belonging, coming after this guy who's learning <laughs> to run away from the sense of belonging. <laughs> and you scares get, him to death. Absolutely. Uh, is her concern about the biological clock a lot more serious a consideration Oftentimes. than his concern about it? Absolutely. In other words, he can yeah. father a baby until he's 50 or 60 years of age, perhaps, and she can't be a mother for very long. That's uh, right. So part of the pressure on her relates to that sometimes. That's kind of where I think a principle from your Love Must Be Tough book comes in because how sometimes. How nice I'm, of you to mention that. <laughs> <laughs> well, how nice of you, you to write it because it's helped a lot of people uh, and we, we recommend it a lot. We have seen quite often that a man will use that as leverage to a woman. Well, you know, I can wait, and I don't know yet, and God hasn't told me yet, <laughs> all these sort of excuses to get away from being intimate with a woman while her clock's ticking. And he will use that for leverage, and sometimes a woman has to say, I have to put a limit on you. I have a time limit. It's, it's this far and no further. And on and on and on, where they have to say, I'm willing to lose my half relationship with this man to either get a, a whole relationship or nothing. And that's when sometimes men kind of grow up faster. Or get scared and run away. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But at least they know. You know, something that I'm observing is that uh, the world has changed a whole lot. And uh, girls do the phoning now. Boys don't call girls on the telephone very much. Girls call boys. That bothers me. That goes counter to my <laughs> cultural understandings. You know, I do they it, open the door as well? Is uh, they probably do. But the one thing is certain: they're a whole lot more aggressive than they used to be. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, girls have always cared more about the romantic attachment and involvement than boys have. Boys have been mm -hmm. interested in girls as a curiosity and certainly sexually, but they have never been quite as motivated about the possibility of a permanent relationship and marriage and children in the adolescent years as girls have. They start thinking, mm -hmm. fantasizing about that possibility very, very early. But there's been a social restraint in the past that's, that's forced girls to hang back and wait for the guy to take the aggressive step, to make the call, to, mm -hmm. to make the date, to make the plans, and so on. That's now disintegrated, or at least it has changed radically. And so it is now acceptable for girls to take that step. And as a result, I think we've got some biological things backwards mm -hmm. where girls are so aggressive that they scare guys. And, and even in the 20s and 30s, uh, an aggressive woman can really make a man run. Mm -hmm. uh, just as I was trying to describe, you mentioned love must be tough. Uh, you tend to move toward that which moves away from you, and you move back from that which is coming your direction too fast. I don't know why it is, but it's true. And I wonder if you have seen what I've seen, that, that some women who are, are aware of that biological clock and are so concerned about finding that bonded relationship uh, drive a man away before he's ever even really enticed. Well, you know, Proverbs says that the earth quakes when an unloved woman finds a husband. Now, that, that is a, a pretty oh graphic goodness. verse, and I think we've all seen that in men and women. If somebody is, is trying to meet some, some very primary unmet relational needs in a spouse, that is a very, very heated kind of chase, and it yeah. can be a very conflicted marriage. And so what we tell singles is that if you've got some, some relational deficits, try to work on those in some setting other than your romantic pursuits, because that relationship was never designed to undo everything you've ever missed in your whole life, and it puts much too much pressure on it. Dr. Dobson, we think that, that marriage is kind of like a, a nice buggy, a Volkswagen buggy, and it can putter along just fine if, if there's not too much on it. But what people will do, well, they'll take their, their family backgrounds of dysfunction or detachment or not being able to make choices or disagree and try to finish by putting a flatbed 18-wheeler on the back and then run it uphill and wonder why it's not working. Huh, and so we try, to de well we try to demystify marriage a little bit and say, you're not going to be any happier as a married person. Your problems are going to be different. But the baggage you bring in, you're going to keep. You really believe that? Absolutely. Yeah. There are an awful lot of single people who feel if they could find somebody to genuinely love, uh, their basic problem in life would be solved. 
you well, don't see it that way. That that is a basic one problem. Basic problem. Yeah. In that there is a basic need to love and to be loved, but we have to learn that and be able to do that before marriage. And and Jesus was single. You know, Paul at least later in life was single. And the need to be loved and to love and to bond and attach to other people is very, very important. But if they cannot do that and are thinking that a spouse is going to somehow for the first time in their life do that, they're setting themselves up for trouble. And that's why we stress the church as a family. The only way a person is going to have what they need out of life is family. It may be a biological family that they've married into. It may be a church family that they've stayed with for 10, 15 years. But this is where those corporate relationships can give them what they didn't have without them having to all of a sudden forge it out with a person that they met six months ago that God's going to give them the repairing they need. Okay, let's, let's talk uh, for a few minutes here and then we'll carry on next time, uh, specifically to the woman who feels like I described a few minutes ago, feels lonely, feels lost, uh, hears the clock ticking, uh, wants more than anything in the world to find somebody to love, to have children, to build a home, uh, to buy a house, uh, to decorate it, to have uh, grandchildren someday, that whole thing that now mm-hmm. seems to be slipping away, that not only do they not have it now, but they may never have it. Uh, what's your advice to that individual, the one who sees that as the only real goal in life, the only thing that really matters? My advice would be to become someone instead of look for someone. That, that oftentimes if there is just horrible, horrible uh, sense of deficit felt, to try to work on oneself to become the most loving person you can be, the most appropriately independent person you can be, the most responsible person you can be, and that will maximize your, your chances of being found. Uh, you do that uh, with an end in mind, or you do it as an end in itself? Well, I would say an end in itself, and uh, like any other fruit bearingness of the scriptures that there are ends um, as results as well. When, when we become the people that God wants us to be, there are good fruits and benefits that happen naturally from that. And one of those fruits is that you are more winsome or attractive. We, people who are doing something they love and feel fulfilled draw people to themselves as opposed to a person who is hungry relationally and is looking for someone to fill that hole up. Uh, we have about a minute left. Uh, John, take the other side of that coin. If we've dealt with one stereotype on the female side, let's talk about the male side. What do you say to the man out there who is uh, uh, not looking for a relationship, is made uncomfortable by it, and uh, and yet doesn't quite feel complete uh, in his life. He'd like a family, but he's a little bit afraid of all the, the implications of that. Do you have any advice for him? Well, the scriptures are real clear that two are better than one, and that it's not good that we be alone, and that there is a uh, an organization called the Body of Christ, or an organism. And a lot of times what we'll have to do uh, with a, a man who's feeling these things is to find out what is fearful about intimacy? Have you been hurt in intimacy? Has, has closeness been a hard thing for you so that you've had to pull back and bond to things other than relationships? Maybe your job, maybe some sort of a, of avocation or vocation, and, and then help them to understand that there's a lot more uh, for them in intimacy and that they don't have to get hurt this time like they got hurt the last time. Well, we'll work through some more of these issues on behalf of the uh, never married single adult tomorrow. Will you be with us? We'll look forward to it. it. Well, that brings us to the conclusion of today's broadcast here on Family Talk. I'm Roger Marsh, and our guests today have been clinical psychologists Dr. John Townsend and Dr. Henry Cloud. Now, I hope you've learned something from the discussion about the concerns facing the unmarried adult today. You can learn more about Dr. Cloud or Dr. Townsend when you go to today's broadcast page at drjamesdobson.org. Once you're there, you'll find information about their popular Boundaries series and much, much more. Simply go to drjamesdobson.org and then click onto the Broadcast tab at the top of the page. 
While you're online, I urge you to get in touch with us through our social media pages. You can like and keep up with our many accounts by searching for Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. Our profiles are full of engaging and godly content that you'll want to share with your friends and family. You can listen to past broadcasts, read Dr. Dobson's newsletter, or just enjoy the articles we've posted. Our goal is to support you, your marriage, and your family. So follow Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, along with many others. The next time you're looking for encouragement on social media, search for Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. Thanks for listening to our broadcast today. Be sure to join us again next time as Dr. Dobson concludes his interview with Drs. John Townsend and Henry Cloud. You won't want to miss that discussion coming up tomorrow right here on Family Talk. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. Hey everyone, did you know that radio is more popular now than ever? A new feature here at Family Talk we're excited to announce. It's called the Station Finder feature. This is Dr. Tim Clinton for Family Talk. I want to tell you how you can listen to our daily broadcast on a station near you. Go to the broadcast menu at drjamesdobson.org, then click on the Family Talk radio stations button. Once you're there, you're going to see an interactive map of radio affiliates, which, by the way, is growing every day. Simply click on your home state, and then you'll see where our broadcast is airing in your town. Stop randomly spinning around the dial, hoping to find Dr. Dobson and Family Talk. Go to drjamesdobson.org and take advantage of this brand new Station Finder feature.